All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Kari Show. I'm on vacation. We're here in Martha's Vineyard, um, kicking it on the <laughs> island. So it's only natural that we have a sports reporter who works in West Palm Beach. Mm. Yes, sir. <laughs> a lot of people dream of vacationing. Yeah. Uh, so um, you know, I gotta, I gotta give a big shout out to my brother from another mother, Theo Dorsey. I went to Hampton with. Um, welcome to the show, man. How you doing? Yeah, flex on him real quick. Let's you know go. What I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Honestly, man, I feel like it's a long time coming. The fact that I'm like 10th or 20th in line in the Kari show, I'm hurt. I'm personally offended, but I'm glad to be here, obviously, man. This is a good good feeling to be relinking up. Stop it, bro. This is actually episode number three, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's your schedule, man. We got to work around you, man, because I know you're doing... TV, radio, the whole nine, man. Catch everybody up on what you're doing these days. Yeah, man. So I'm a sports anchor at ESPN West Palm. Started in November. I was one of the, the blessed people to get a job in the pandemic, which is um, something I'll be able to say for the rest of my life. Hopefully this is an anomaly this year and a half or so that we have, and we don't have anything like it. But I do TV, radio. Um, I do the local sports for West Palm Beach, Palm Beach County, uh, up to the Treasure Coast. We cover a lot of that football, basketball, flag football, baseball. I've been covering polo. Yeah. I've been covering like water polo, like all of these. I like the eccentric, the off the beaten path, um, you know, sports stories that they have out here. It's pretty cool. What's your favorite story you've done since you've been there? Hmm. Favorite story so far. I did a story with this kid. He's like the um, assistant athletic director at a school, Martin County High School. And he, uh, you know, he's a special needs kid, a kid that graduated from that high school. And I don't think anybody in this world loves Martin County more than this kid. And yeah. they gave him like a job on the athletic staff after he graduated. And he's just full of energy, man. He was rooting them on. When I did the story on him, the basketball team was undefeated in the playoffs. Ooh. So, so I, I kind of phrased it as like that's their secret weapon is him in the in the uh, on the staff. So that's cool. Beautiful, beautiful. So yeah. what's it like actually living in West Palm, man? I mean, you've been out there what five months now. So uh, how's how's it been living out there? It's cool, man. Like it's it's weird because it's one of those places where there's like every other person you meet is either like like crazy rich or and a lot of people you meet are like crazy poor. There's like that real weird division that every and everybody's living right like kind of like right next to each other right. um it's nice being around those like you know being surrounded by beaches i've never seen so many palm trees in my life like <laughs> you know like people from other places outside of florida and california like are just not used to seeing that even like when my family or friends come out and check it out they're like yo it's palm trees everywhere i feel like i'm on vacation yeah it's crazy man do you feel like you're on vacation or are you always grinding it in the mix <laughs> it seems pretty busy out there yeah i was about to say you know how the sports world is man we're never on vacation but this <laughs> is i'll say this though this job has probably provided me with the most downtime of any of the jobs i've worked i've worked in north carolina as a news reporter and sports anchor i worked in south georgia for a while as a sports director also a weekend sports anchor did some news there uh the grind in those areas probably was like a little bit more day-to-day -day. um but the work here is still very meaningful. I do have more downtime to do stuff like the car show, though, so that's dope. Let's go, man. So fill people, <laughs> fill people in on your background, man. Like, obviously, we met at Hampton, so you went to Hampton. But obviously, you're from Mo City. Um, huh. You know, just just tell tell people about the, thump, the, 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 the humble beginnings of Theo Dorsey. The humble beginning. It looked like you had a backdoor uh, visitor right there as we talk. <laughs> oh, <it's> my mom. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> this is Thompson. What's going on? Familiar. Yeah, we're doing the car show. What's up? Oh, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool. Yeah, no, it's cool. This oh, is I a great interjection. I know. I thought you were just saying hello. I didn't know. You're on the show. You're live. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. well, oh, say, you what's should up? turn around and see the greenery behind you, son. The fields and TV. He fixed my lighting for me because the lighting. Like, you got to get the lighting the in the space. Oh, okay. Lovely. Lovely. <laughs> yeah, enjoy. Good to see you. Good to see yeah. you as well. Theo, what state is he in? He's in Florida. Florida. Where you live now, Theo? I'm in West Palm Beach, Florida, amongst sounds the palm trees. Awesome. Sounds awesome. Yeah. Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you. You know what? We'll start the story there, too, then. Because remember, yeah. Boston and ABJ is low-key kind of where it all started. Y'all were gracious enough to let me stay there when we went there. So. Oh, you're right, so right, sweet. Right, right. Anytime. Anytime. <laughs> I told Thank you. I you have a reunion down here in the vineyard. Yeah, man. 
You know what I'm saying? Let me know, man. Yeah, man. Ticket, you got to scan them and Anytime. make sure they have their COVID, their COVID uh, vaccines. I'm half vexed. Give me like a week and a half and I'll be all the way vaccine. All right. I'm going to my bike ride. Bye. Oh, yeah. Right. Peace. Yeah, okay. Man. Where were we? You know what? That's a good starting point because um, I think my sports journalism life did take off when I did go to that Boston NABJ, stayed up with you and your family, and we both got our introduction to NABJ that, that uh, year. Right. I will, I will say first, like you said, I'm from Mo City, Texas. That's my heart. That's my love and joy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I love getting there two, three times a year. Um, but, yeah, man, we met at Hampton. I think this was, what, my junior year and your freshman year. Right, 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 right. Um, you were a young, aspiring you know, wet behind the ears, sports reporter. And yeah. at that time I was, um, you know, sports anchor and I did some stuff with the Hampton script and we both kind of met early on there and established a friendship and we became kind of colleagues, especially that next year when we started doing AOL sports together. Right. Um, did the give and go with Kari and Theo. And what a sports smash hit. <laughs> hit. We was getting like 40,000 reviews for pod and whatnot at a certain point. Like, we did some stuff with the Hampton radio station. I mean, we did so much. It's funny when I look back on it, because I remember we did Elite Insider stuff. Yeah, we did. We did a lot. Um, we did the D-League. The D-League. That's its like, own separate podcast. <laughs> dude, we could, we could get lost in the weeds talking about yeah. all of that. But, Good talk. Um, but you were kind of there for the formation of what I've kind of become as a sports journalist because you saw all of that entrepreneurship within – you saw a lot of that creativity, and we did that from the ground up, all the brainstorming to come up with these shows. So um, it's funny because talking to you about it, I feel like you know the story almost as well as I do. All right, all uh, right. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's uh, – just talk about that that need to, uh, to do your own thing and make your own show because I think a lot of people in college, they kind of go with the flow. They do classes or they work with the paper, but – one thing I've always noticed about you, Theo, is you always had your own show. You always had something lined up. Just what is that about you that makes you always want to do that? Man, like, it's kind of like what Jay said in that song when he was kind of sneak dissing Drake. Until you own your own, you can't be me. You know what I'm saying? Until you own your own, you can't be free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and honestly, I always felt that way. Like, my, my big brother's always been big on that, too. Um, and it just gives you more creativity. It gives you more, like, freedom to, to kind of, like, do what you want, be your own boss. We live and work in an industry where it's nothing but them controlling you. It's like you're Pinocchio and they're – whatever that guy's name is. Yeah, Geppetto, Geppetto, Geppetto. Geppetto. I, don't, I never Geppetto. get it right. I do. <laughs> but, no, they really love to control you in this industry, and they get you have to ask permission for so much. So even from the early days in college, you know, people ask me, why would you have so many shows? Why would you start the blog? I had Elite Insiders. We had Stretch Four Hoops. We had the D-League. Right. Um, all of that stemmed from whenever I had to ask too many questions. Like, when I was in scripts, I was like, I wanted to do something. I, you know, I had to ask Professor Plummer or Dean Pulley, and I had to get permission from them. And it's like, I felt now I'm growing into a young man myself. I should be able to build my own brand without having to ask somebody, can they say yes or no to something? So that's what it really was all about. Like, I wanted to be able to be myself, be creative, and not have to ask permission for it. Right. And uh, and that's always to this day, like right now, like <laughs> I'm still trying to come up with shows and create things and express myself and not have, you know, not be like, you know, man, may I please can I, I'm thinking about doing this. Like, no, yeah. I want to be able to just do it. Real chat. Real chat. Yeah. Yeah. So, how, how, so uh, how, how has that played into, um, you know, what you're doing today? Do you feel like the stuff that you did throughout college helped build your brand? It did. I mean, a lot of people, not a lot of people, but there are people that still kind of remember some of those things we did, like Give and Go, um, right. you know, like Elite Insiders, D-League. I formed a lot of good relationships through those. And I learned, you know, one of the funny things, and I, I never meant to do it, I learned a lot of, like, management-type skills and, right. like, how to deal with, like team, like, more team building and teamwork skills. I would have never got those skills had I just stuck to classwork and internships. Facts. You think about it, classwork, you're not really working in teams. You're doing group projects where one person carries the load and everybody else signs their name. Right. Internships, you're doing bottom level work that nobody else wants to do at the job places most of the time. When like, you're when you're doing your own thing, you're not just the host, you're the host, you're the editor, 
You're the yeah. chief marketing office officer. Yeah, you know what I'm saying you're, you're, you're low key like the PR team. The PR we team. We have PR issues. You got. <laughs> we right. had some PR. Issues. I was on the call with president of NABJ because of that. I talked to like a couple people on the board. We had some some things that come about, and I would have never known how to dance that and you know walk that tight rope had it not been for those experiences. Like. You're a facilities manager. Remember, we used to have to sign out the key to the radio station. Oh my goodness! <laughs> get equipment to get those Dude. late night shows. Signing out the equipment late night, um, working, putting the schedules together. When we did Elite Insiders, we had like fifteen to twenty different writers spread amongst like ten different campuses in America, and right. I had to like break out schedules for everybody. I had to be like, okay, we need two articles from you this week. I had to edit people's work. I had to kind of motivate some people to put more work out. Um, I had to help grow people. That's where it's funny because I mentor a lot of people now, and they kind of wonder where that kind of stems from. Well, it, it kind of started when we started doing, like, Indeed Insiders and stuff, and I was forced to mentor people to help them get better in their writing to better the brand, you know? Right. So I learned those skills early on, and it, all of it was by accident. Like, all I wanted to do was just create our own, build a brand, and – and during the time, like, I grew so much in all these other areas I would have never assumed, you know? Right. Well, that brings me to my next question, because the next question was going to be, like, what was the dream? Like, what was, like, eight-year-old Theo running around what he wanted to do? Did you always want to be, like, a sports guy on TV, or what was what was the dream? It's, it's weird, man. Like, I don't – I hate to do the typical young black boy thing and say I want to go to the league, but, like <laughs> – <laughs> I would I prefer to say I had no aspirations. I would prefer to say that because all of us thought we were gonna go play ball in the NBA, right? Right, right, right. I hate I hate even admitting that I was just another kid that wanted to play in the NBA, but um I didn't really have any real aspirations or any guidance. Like even in high school, not just eight years old, but even up to my high school age, I didn't know I was gonna be a sports anchor. Like I thought honestly, I didn't know what I played Halo 3 in NBA Live for like 23 of the 24 hours out of my day. Facts. Easy. Like, <laughs> right? Like, in high school, a matter of fact, I wasn't even really going to high school. My junior and senior year of high school, I used to leave high school at 12 o'clock and go work a job in customer service at this makeup company. Gerwitz Products. Gerwitz Products. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, we talked about this. <laughs> I was a Gerwitz Products guy. Like, I was like, look, <laughs> I was so disconnected from reality. And then one day I got to, to Hampton's campus and something snapped. And I was like, yo, like, let me try to make something of my life. And so far, I mean, this is what I got going right now. Real talk. Real talk. I slipped into this, but God really helped. And uh, my family and my support system and my friends and people like you, like during those four years, like that was so pivotal for me, for sure. For sure. I mean, just help people get to know you more, man. Like, what do you what are you into outside of your job, man? What are your what are your big hobbies? Like, when you're not working, what are you doing? Just kicking it. That was my big name. Remember when we was on Clubhouse, we would always say like, talk about something other than your job. Yeah. And then people <laughs> still still fall back into talking about their jobs. I don't know Real why. Tight. But it's um, because you do something that you enjoy. Though. That's the thing. Like. That's true. It's hard. I think in journalism, and maybe this is, you can agree or disagree with this, but I think like journalism more than a lot of professions, your job is tied to your identity. Like you like go like, I'm a reporter for this station or, you know, yeah. then I do this in media. You know what I'm yeah. saying? You, you, you find that accurate? It is. And you know what? It's not even particularly our fault. Like once we sign those contracts, for one, to the general public, we are. That is who we are. Like, Kari Thompson, you are a, a high school sports reporter for the Commercial Appeal right. to the general public. When they see your Twitter profile and your Instagram, they don't think of you as Kari, the young guy that likes to play guitar. Right. Like, <laughs> they think of you as the reporter. Right. Whereas I feel like people that are doctors or even other occupations, like, think about in 2021, how do people judge you off of what they see on social media for the most part? Real talk. Right? So I think people in other occupations can have – their social medias are a lot of times separate from their work. Right. We're not afforded that opportunity. Right. That's, that's so, true. That's true. Like, that's a big part of it. What's your social media philosophy? Like, are you – are, are you are you super cautious about what you post because the fact you're a reporter? Or, like, do you feel like you have some freedom there? 
I, I look, man. I'm I'm kind of wild. So this is my thing. <laughs> I get wild, but I don't get wild in a way that would go outside of my own character and right. ethics. Like for me, I I haven't really changed much since I was since my college days. Like if I feel something or I want to say something, I'm gonna tweet it. If it's something funny, I'm going to put it on Instagram. Some things do have to get pulled back into close friends or whatnot. But I like to have fun because it is like me being me. And I, I think I have a good enough radar or like gauge in my mind to where I'm not going to say something that gets me fired. Right. I might have to talk to some people one time. <laughs> <or two. laughs> like, talk to HR. <laughs> yeah, like I might get pulled into the office, but at least I know they're paying attention. Like that's sometimes you got to just check and see if they're paying attention. Okay, y'all paying attention? Okay, cool, cool. <laughs> All right. so what do you what do you, what do you think about this? I, I saw this on Twitter one day, and I was like, "Oh, it's kind of interesting." People say like Instagram is like your appearance, but Twitter is like your personality. Like that's yeah. what it's all about. Like you definitely showing it off. Like that's true. I think that's very true. Because when people want to see what somebody looks like, or like see what their life is like, or what they're up to, they go to Instagram. Right. Because that's like a portfolio of me, like, like, that's like a, it's almost like a, I don't want to quote this song, but <laughs> Kendrick had that uh, line in uh, No More Parties in LA. Right. Instagram is the best way to promote. I don't know if you know, it, but I'm not going to say it because I don't know what kind of vulgarities are allowed on your podcast. <laughs> I mean, honestly, man, we just kicking it. But uh, yeah, I just, I, I, I've, I've listened to No Parties in LA a million times. And I, I'm mad that I can't pick out the particular pick, He said line. Instagram is the best way to promote, and it's something that women have that guys don't. But <laughs> okay. what he was kind <laughs> of alluding <laughs> to. Instagram is the best way to promote. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I remember that. I remember that. <laughs> so, yeah. and honestly, it just is. That's what Instagram is for a lot of the times. Like, women are promoting themselves. Guys, it's like almost like a dating app versus Twitter is a place where we kind of laugh, joke, and break news. Like, That's true, man. That's true. And we're, all, we're the only ones that break news on there. See, that's the thing. See, Kari, like, we're not allowed to separate ourselves from our jobs like other people. Yeah. Like, Definitely. lawyers I know, everybody else on Twitter is just, like, having fun. We're also breaking news or, like, tweeting out links and stuff. It's like... You got to be can't. super conscious. Yeah. You yeah. can't be political. Like... <laughs> can't be political. You're getting them talks. How tough like, is it? So I like, hold your tongue with like everything that went on in 2020. Like I, you did that I didn't have a wild ass year. <laughs> I didn't hold my tongue. This was my thing, especially especially once I walked away from the industry willingly and sat out for that long and went without it and realized I can survive and not only survive but kind of thrive at least with my own personal well being and mental health and even financial stability. I went. I'm doing my taxes now. It's not like I lost that much more money. Right. I just was hustling more. So. Once I realized I'm self-sustainable without the industry, it gave me way more confidence. Like, I stand 10 toes down on everything I do now. So being back in it, like, I'm still a black man. If I see a tweet or if I see something, like, even, like, I didn't quote tweet it, like, Ted Cruz and said some foul stuff. Like, I don't get political. Like, I'm not going to stand up on a rock and say, I am this and this is what I stand for. But if you say some wild stuff or, like, Ted Cruz, how he abandoned Texas right. or, like, when Donald Trump was wilding, like, even if Joe Biden started wilding, I don't care. I'm going to either side of the aisle. If there's something against black men, if it's something against people that look like me or anybody that's disenfranchised, I'll speak out on it, and I'll deal with the consequences later. Real talk. And no consequences so far. I did get sent the social media policy twice. <laughs> <laughs> they love sending that social media policy. They didn't say what I did wrong. All they did was just sit the social media policy. I was like, right, appreciate right, it. Right, right, right. And they send it to multiple people, so it doesn't look like it's just you. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is clever. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so either you're going to have to send me that direct tweet I sent or, uh, you know. Uh, right, right. right. <laughs> and we could talk about it. <laughs> uh, well, t fill me in more about your journey on uh, to, to self-sufficiency, man. I mean, like, honestly, from the outside, all we see is the successful version of Theo and what you project mm -hmm. on your social media. But... It sounds like you had some time away from journalism to kind of find yourself and do some different things. What was that like? Man, I, it was so, it, it was so therapeutic for me just as a young man, because again, we're so tied, our identities, our personality, everything is tied to our career. Right. And I remember even on the front half of that, 
I made it a point when people asked me, because, you know, I left North Carolina in October of 2019. So between October and March, because that's before pandemic. So pre-pandemic is October, March pandemic hits. I'm in Houston and I'm like a high school basketball referee. I'm like a substitute teacher. I'm a I pressure wash driveways. Um, I eventually started driving for Amazon. Like I'm doing these kind of gigs. And at first I was kind of shy to admit that I was those things and not what my glamorous career was beforehand. Right. Right. But then I became more, as I grew more and more confident with myself and just, I'm Theo again. Like I'm not just the reporter. I'm Theo Dorsey. Like the guy who's kind of cool to be around. I crack a joke. Crack right. a beer open, like let's kick it. Like I don't have to be what I used to have to be. So like I started growing more and more confident in that and being like, yeah, man, yeah, I'm a substitute teacher. Like when I met people to talk to people, like it was always like I don't even bring I stopped bringing up like the news background. Like it, really? it became yeah, I became disassociated from it until I started doing here somethings again. What did which didn't happen until like the pandemic was really like a thing. Yeah. I was really disassociated from news. Like the only thing that kept me tied to it was my mentees who I would talk to like almost on a daily basis, if not more than that, um, who would like, you know, I would kind of give them some feedback, bounce back things for them, like with their growth in the industry. Cause I didn't want to give up on them, but me, I want to say by about December from December until about June or July, I was totally like out of news, out of sports just being a regular, like, civilian working, you know, substitute teacher. I started driving for Amazon, listening to audio books, like, podcasts. I grew so much just in my own confidence of who I really was outside of the industry, and it makes me more comfortable now being in it because I know I can lose it and, again, be, you know, unaffected. Makes you that much more grateful for it, for sure. Um, you know, because I, I had my own detour. Uh, people, people don't remember that I went to law school like an idiot and ran up <laughs> a crazy amount of loans and like, oh you know what I'm saying? Like everybody else like got jobs right out of school and like started and, you know, like, man, I had a detour. I was a little bit too ambitious. So that one not only cost me a year of just working experience, but it cost me money. <laughs> yeah, so, like, it's different. So, uh, no, I, I totally get you. And, and, you're, and you're right. It's different when you can kind of detach yourself from saying, I'm um, so-and-so, you know what I'm saying? Cause like deep down just feels be good being a regular dude, you know, yeah. like, and just kicking it. Like I went, I was going, I like, I went to the protest in Houston cause you know, George Floyd broke out around then. I like went to the protest, had a sign up that had some vulgar things on it about <laughs> uh, law enforcement that I, I probably couldn't do as a journalist. Like, yeah. But um, yeah, but like those things you can do and you can breathe easy knowing that you don't have a contract or somebody owns your likeness and your appearances. And I'm like, uh, that's what was, it, what was it like being able to kick back and watch sports without having to cover it for that time? Dude, it well, that's the that's the bad part about it was then sports stopped. Yeah, right? oh. <laughs> like you know, honestly, I got to watch more sports when I was in North Carolina as a Monday through Friday news reporter. Yeah. Because I was working nine to five, nine to six, you know, so I was like a normal person for once. Right. Um, and I was able to go out to happy hours, which I can't do ever these days, like watch, you know, games at the bar, watch games over the weekend. So I got to do more of that when I was in North Carolina. Once I left, I came back to Houston. Um, I guess the NFL was going on. I would I would go over to a kill, you know, a kill, a yeah. guy, Kill Williams. We would watch like NFL Sundays. We'd go to like a brunch and just watch all the games all the way through um or just have drinks over at his house and just watch sunday nfl ticket do fantasy football it was a great time for just taking in sports and i am going to miss that because for the next 30 40 years i'll be covering sports and not enjoying them so right 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 <laughs> so you were in so you were in houston with your family during the pandemic yeah that was like a blessing in disguise was it Hey, bro, that's all I'm saying. Like, I would not so, – so I have a question for you. Do you regret the the college or the law school move at Villanova, even though you got a, a national championship out of it? Uh, I don't regret it at all because it was a great experience. And like you said, like, doing something different taught me a lot about myself. And, you know, like, trying to become a lawyer made me realize how much more boring my life would be if I actually <laughs> went through with it. <laughs> exactly. I feel you on that, right? Um, and some people will say, like, 
outside looking in, some people are like, ah, oh, you should probably, like, you, but, like, no, like, everything that you go through, you, you should learn from um, right. and kind of grow from. And, like, you learned and grew from that law school experience. Um, I don't regret a second of what I did, and I think it all worked out. I wouldn't have been able to get the ES ESPN West Palm job had I not le left the industry when I did. Um, I would have been stuck in North Carolina covering the pandemic on a day-to-day -day basis as a news reporter. Like, because you think about it, I was actually enjoying being a news reporter because there's a variety when you're doing news. I'm covering why we need more pilots in the city this today, and then tomorrow is a double homicide. The next day, it's a, you know, you never know. Right. Um, versus... Yo, I was watching the stories that they were doing from, like, March through August every day. Coronavirus numbers are doing this to this. Yeah. Oh, this, this is closed, and they're losing money because corona. It's, it was, like, all coronavirus coverage. I would have, like, literally – I wouldn't have survived it. I don't think so. Nah, it got real. I mean, like, I had to, I had to fill in on some, some COVID stuff just being in my newspaper because, obviously, like you said, sports stop. And, yeah, man, uh, it's – it's a depressing thing to cover day in and day out. And it was Dude. just the it was the convergence of COVID and George Floyd. That was just wild. Oh my like, god. <laughs> like like being out in protests, like, you know, while while people are like, oh, the protesters aren't wearing masks, they're gonna be super spreaders. Like Yeah. Oh my god. I mean, it was just 2020 was just a summer for the history books, man, no doubt. It was wild. And you're right, I was very thankful to be able to be around family during that time. Um, and also it was easier on my pockets that it was a pandemic right. while I also, so it was like, I wasn't alone in being broke, kind of yeah. broke. <laughs> right. I didn't want to say like, but I wasn't alone in being broke <laughs> because the whole country was broke. So I was like, <laughs> we all broke, baby. <laughs> man, man, man. Yeah. So it's a bad thing, obviously for everybody involved and I hate, hate it, but I think that for my own personal life, things lined up almost perfectly. No, for sure, for sure, for sure. So what are you trying to do, man? Like, where are you trying to take it to the next level, man? What are, what are your goals for the next couple of years? Um, it's funny, man. And it's another way I've changed. Like, before the pandemic and before I left the industry, I used to always, like, oh, I want to do this by then and this by this. But, like, now I kind of really – I'm not even just saying this to be, like, political or, like, true to my job or whatever. Like, I don't have any real – pending long-term goals like my goals are more so intermediate like I want to grow in radio I want to get better at it I want to learn the ins and outs of it what makes a good show host or co-host co or guest um I want to become you know a reliable source for sports news here in South Florida I think there's a vacancy when it comes to like some of the like sports anchors out here they're not really kind of breaking news as much. They're not really telling impactful stories as much. Right. And I think that I can feel that void out here. So I kind of like, I'm only five, six months in, but I think in the next year or so, I want to be able to have all these coaches contacts and be able to reach out to them. And I want to be able to be locked in on recruiting stuff. And I want to be telling stories that these communities actually care about. Because as you know about South Florida, unless the big three is out here, they don't care that much about anything. Right. Like, they're all rich on the beach or they're, like, you know, day-to-day -day workers who have, you know, live in check to check. Like, right. there's not a lot of just hardcore, you know, FAU fans or even Miami Heat fans. Like, they're not even <laughs> – we're only – I'm a Heat fan myself, but, like, people in South Florida only care if, if, it, if they're winning championships or whatnot. Um, so, I don't know, man. Like, I think down the line, if I was to project out what I would be – um. Hopefully I find a, a good, hopefully I find a, a wave or like uh, my position here in this market and I want to be winning awards and I want to just be on top of it. I want to own this market. That's my right. real long-term goal right now. That seems like kind of an important shift, right? Because like now you're talking about just like, I want to grow internally versus I want this job. Yeah. I think a lot of people get into journalism like, I want this job in this place doing this thing mm. but it's a different type of journey when you can look at yourself and like self-analyze and be like i need to get better at this i need to get better at that i want to do this you know i think that's definitely yeah. a different type of thing for your development yeah for sure bro i want to be the best here and i don't want there to be any question about it you right know? right so we'll see we'll see what i do <laughs> for sure 
Now, living out there in West Palm with all these rich people, are you one of those types that just drives around and looks at the mansions and like, it's like, what if that's going to be me one day? Or do you, are you just like accustomed to it all? Well, I mean, you know, the, <laughs> when I was driving Amazon, I saw some amazing houses on the west side of Houston. So I was all, I've already seen it, some of the most luxurious mansions. You know, in Houston, we do it big. It's just right. acres. I was like, yo, what? Everything's bigger in Texas. <laughs> right. It was crazy. I saw some crazy houses. So I've already had the sightseeing experience when I was working that delivery job, um, which was really awesome. Um, here I have driven along in the Palm Beach area, you know, where the biggest states are, mostly to get to the beach, but you pass it up and it's cool. Um, I'm not that, I don't get that breath taken by beautiful houses unless I'm able to like park the car and go inside it. Right. Just looking at the right, outsides right, of right. them, that's not, it don't really do much for me, you know? Right, right, right. Do you but get starstruck cool. though when you see celebrities? Uh, not anymore. It depends on who the celebrity is, you know? So, like, for me, if it's somebody who, like, I would get more starstruck if I saw ran into Hannibal Burris right now than if I ran into Julia Roberts. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Only because Hannibal <laughs> Burris. Why did you think of those two? I have no clue. <laughs> I have no clue. <laughs> but uh, I just thought of the first white actress I could think of. <laughs> like, what, about, like, what about, like, if LeBron walked up to you? Would you be starstruck? Being a sports LeBron. Player? LeBron, it will, I think I will be a little more starstruck with LeBron only because of what he means. Like, so, like, for instance, like, I wouldn't be starstruck by KD. Ooh. I wouldn't be starstruck by, like, Steph Curry. Why? Is it the burner? Is it the burner? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think if I want to tweet at KD, I think I can get a response today. I think that's the difference. <laughs> All you got to do is poke the bear a little bit with KD. But, no, I think it's Careful, because of my screenshot. <laughs> that's true, though. That's true, too. Uh, something about LeBron and what he means to, I think we take it for granted a lot, but something about LeBron and what he means to this generation, even though he is very, very head ass and he, <laughs> he does a lot of things for show and whatnot, but what he means and what his story means to this generation at large, like I think is bigger than what we're actually grasping. Right. And I have a good perspective of that. So like, I know just how important he is. Like, KD is just an elite basketball player. He's important in his own way, but it's more so about him being an elite basketball player. So is Steph Curry. But, like, LeBron and what he does to promote black fatherhood and the school in Ohio and, like, the up from nothing story and him not having a father figure. Like, all of these things are very important to, I think, especially when we look back on it 40 years from now. And the fact that he's, like, amazing in year 18, like. Right. Everything about dude is kind of wild, and I don't think we appreciate it enough in this moment, but 30 years from now, we're going to look back and be like, dang, like, we ain't know what we had. <laughs> what impresses me the most about LeBron is, like, how he put his homies on. Like, yeah. basically how him, him and, you know, Maverick and Rich and all those guys, they all came up together, and they learned – in their in their industries and they all put in their work but obviously lebron is kind of the engine that makes that car go i think yeah. any of those guys would admit that so that's what's impressive to me because lebron created generational wealth not just for himself but for his boys and they stuck together and that's something that is like super duper impressive like i've never seen anything like it and even and you're right about that. That's and the problem with LeBron James and the reason why we take him for granted so much is because we can only appreciate so many things at one time without seeming like we're just doing it like LeBron, like we're just shining them off all day. Like right. it's you can only, but like he's created generational wealth for those guys. He's created generational wealth for Tristan Thompson. For, <laughs> like, like we get to the, like Mike Miller got contracts off of him. Uh, Danielle Marshall, Booby Gibson, like. Think about all the players also in the NBA. Iman Shumpert, J.R. Smith, like Kevin Love. He kind of bolstered his – well, actually, he might have done uh, – Kevin Love was a bigger star. Before. He was he was a bigger star before. I was about to say, he might have done more against Kevin Love than not. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But um, if Kyrie doesn't get that championship with him, do we really care about Kyrie? Like – it's yeah, just like another we Zach do. Levine. We do, just because of Kyrie's skill set, I'd say. Oh, you say that, I mean, but before but LeBron the got shot, there. The shot he hit over Curry raised, raised his profile for sure. He doesn't like, Kyrie get to that moment. Kyrie would be a star in this league. Huh? He would be a star in this league, but I, we, he wouldn't be a – he's not a winning star by himself. We saw that right. when he went to right. Boston. We know that. We've seen that ever since – ever since 
Kyrie without LeBron has never been something that we cared or paid attention to until oh we paid attention to his antics for sure like well, that, but do the antics matter if he didn't have that chip that's the thing that's all post lebron yes bro because Kyrie is like bro i mean <laughs> we only care because he won that chip and he hit that shot without that chip and without that shot and without lebron he would be like a zach levine like a really highly skilled player who scores a lot of points but isn't really on winning teams Damn, you come from the Zach Levine. I don't know if I can I'm not that. saying he that's is that crazy. Okay, that's Bradley crazy. Bill. Oh, Bradley Bill. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not disrespecting Kyrie. I understand the talent that he is, but I'm just saying without that chip, he's not like like my girlfriend knows who Kyrie Irving is. Facts. She wouldn't know she doesn't know who Bradley Bill is. I think without <laughs> <laughs> I think without that chip with LeBron. Like, let's just say hypothetically LeBron never goes back to Cleveland. Kyrie stays in Cleveland for seven or eight years. Then he goes to Boston and whatever. Even if he ends up on this Brooklyn team, like, I don't know if we care about him that much because he's not James Harden. He's not Kevin Durant. Yeah, he's, he's the own. third best player on that team, but he has a bigger name than, than them in some areas. Like, That's true. And I think branding helps, too. I mean, I just think that, like, I don't know what it is with this skill set. It seems like little guards coming up love him. Like, they just love the way he plays. That's true. I mean, I, I'm i with you. I just think without that chip, without him playing on the – because think about it. It's not just the chip. It's the fact that he was playing on the big stage. Right, right. So, like, he would have never got to the big stage. And he jade up Curry, too. I mean, he that was – like, Right. You're like, right. He, he hit it on Steph. Like, he know, did it. Was, he created – he, he's that talented, so it makes sense that he was able to do it. But without the platform that LeBron provided him, I don't think he is the star he is today. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes you know, sense. That that's makes all sense. I'm saying. Because he's still the third best player on this Brooklyn team, and it's not close. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So I'll give that to you. Did you see that play with Kevin Love where he just, like, batted the ball and walked away? Like, Wait, which one? Oh, man. There's this clip going around on Twitter that went semi-viral where, like, I think Kevin Love is supposed to inbound the ball. And, like, instead of, like, making a legit pass to his teammate, he just, like, kind of swiped it like this and just let it go to, like, a player from the Raptors. And the, the player, like, swung it back and, like, kicked it out for an open three. Like, oh it's crazy. And everyone's like, what are you doing? Like, Shaq and a Fool tweeted about it. Like, the, the Shaq account it was just recent. about it. Yeah. This is, like, yesterday. Oh, no, I didn't see it. Then. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I didn't see it. Check it out. Check it out. Check it out. I got to see it. Should I look right now? Yeah, I mean, you can pull it up for sure. I mean, it's just, I mean, just Kevin Love, I think, is trending, or at least he was this morning. <laughs> Kevin, I didn't even know he had returned to action. He had been out for like ever. I know, I know. <laughs> Wait. Why is this, why is this clip? Okay, here we go. Oh, he's wild. He started walking <laughs> off the court. Yeah. He didn't want to play basketball. <laughs> he did not want to play basketball right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was that? Oh, hey. Oh, I love this. Hey, guess guess who the two players are that I have on my team, on my uh, fantasy team? OG Ananobi, who gets a steal. And I have Matt Flynn, who gets a, a three-pointer. And OG gets the assist. So that's a great super play by me. My fantasy team just came up. Fantasy boys. <laughs> it's the fantasy basketball playoffs right now. Thank you, Kevin Yo. Love. That's what Kevin Love was doing. He was benefiting Teddy Dolo's. Uh, what is my fantasy team name with that group? Like, stay ready, Teddy. Stay ready, Teddy. <laughs> so was, the, so the Sauce and Celtics are no more. No, the Sauce and Celtics on. are a thing of the past. You moved on. This is stay ready, Teddy. I have two teams. One of them is stay ready, Teddy. One of them is most city Texas. So, okay, okay. So there's no more drip left in Boston. You're saying no more drip. The drip left when Kyrie left. I'm sorry. Oh my goodness. Yeah, oh, ran a lot of better time. without Kyrie though. That was the thing. I don't know what's going on this year, but. Exactly. Another thing that just another strike against Kyrie Irving. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm telling you, bro, without LeBron James, I don't know if that dude is who he is. Like big facts. So I don't know. It's something to think about. It's gonna be a think piece in 20 years. Right. Can you kind of tell being in South Florida, just like is is his impact, is LeBron's impact there bigger than where it is nationwide, or is it just like I don't know. Do they still have a special space in their hearts for that LeBron? My general manager, when I when I first moved out here in November or so, I don't remember. My general manager yelled. She's a white lady. She yelled until her face was red about things she hated about LeBron. Some people still really hate that he left Miami. 
Oh, she has goodness. she has hate in her heart. Like this is what, and mind you, this is our first time. Is she being a Jersey person. burner. I she might have been. <laughs> she might have been. But we're all sitting at this happy hour. They were doing this introductory happy hour for me so I can meet all of my new teammates and whatnot. And she's sitting there, and she just goes off. I'm like, is she serious? She's sitting right next to me, too. I think some spit hit my, my, my forehead as she was yelling. <laughs> so, Stephanie Prince, that's my, that's my, you know, GM, that's my dog. But she is not like LeBron James. And there are some people that have that kind of disdain for her. But normal Heat fans like myself appreciate the two championships and keep it pushed. Facts. He was a mercenary. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I love it. I love it because someone like that, you can win wherever you go. Yeah. You know, that takes a special type of skill, you know what I'm saying? Because, like, a lot of people are dependent upon the infrastructure around them and the coaching and the GM. And it's like LeBron finds a way. I mean, granted, he practically is a GM with all the yeah. that he's making. But, the GM. <laughs> I mean – we saw how good of a player Michael Jordan was and how trash he was at being a GM. <laughs> oh, yeah. He was an actual GM, and he, stink, he stuck it up. He <laughs> like, still is stinking it up. Like, being able to put together a winning roster is a skill. And, like, LeBron has showed that wherever he goes, he's going to win. Uh, I still have a Sh- Shabazz Napier, Napier uh, strike against him, but we'll we'll leave that <laughs> off the record. Shout yeah. out to Shabazz, man. One of the best <laughs> players from Boston in the league, man. Is he in the league? Well. Was in the league. <laughs> <laughs> that made it to the league period at one time, man. But, um, man, did you hear about the Terrence Clark news? No. Terrence Clark, the, 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 the God, Clark You said what? Terrence Clark, the Kentucky oh, player. Oh, Kentucky player. When you said Terrence, I, I don't know why I thought of Terrence Ross. Yeah. No, yeah, Terrence, Terrence Clark, Clark, I did see that. Yeah, like 19 years old. Crazy. I, did they ever say if the kid um, BJ Boston like got into like was he involved in the wreck? I know they said no. He was BJ. Okay. So what happened was they were both leaving a workout in Los Angeles, and BJ was in the car behind him. Mm-hmm. So BJ was fine physically. He just least. he just saw it happen. He, I think he saw it. Yeah, he was walking around though. He was good. He's 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 not injured. Oh, so afterwards he kind of got out the car and he was like there. He was at the scene for sure. There's pictures of him at the scene. Dang. Yeah, see, when I saw, I didn't, I couldn't even read none of those stories or anything. Like, I saw what happened. I saw that they said BJ was okay, and I just was like, I I was kind of at a loss for words. I, I just didn't, I was like, this is, like, incredibly sad. Like, Dude, I read that headline, and I wanted to puke. Um, yeah. Just because, like, just you bringing up Shabazz, you know, made me think of Terrence because, like. Oh, he's dude, from Boston. There's, there's not that many players of his caliber that come from Boston. Yeah, I forgot about that like, from Boston. He was about to be the best player from Boston in the NBA since, like, Patrick Ewing. Like, yeah. like, Patrick Ewing like, like, is from Boston? Decades. Grew up in Cambridge. Really? Well, he's from Jamaica originally, but he moved over to Cambridge when he was a teenager, and he actually went to high school with my dad. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, y'all have Nerlens Noel, right? Yeah, but I'm saying, like, like Nerlens Noel is a good player. He's a rim protector and a rim runner. But, like, um, and uh, granted, I, I have no place talking smack about Nerlens Noel because his AAU teams used to destroy ours because he's about our age. But, yeah. like, no, man, Terrence Clark was, like, top 10 in the country when he came out of high school. Like, yeah. he was going to be a, he was gonna be a star. I mean, he didn't have Kentucky. that great of a year at Kentucky because he got hurt. But, like, man, it's just crazy just seeing someone with, like, that level of skill – that level of charisma. And, like, he signed with – since we were talking about LeBron, it all ties in because, like, he signed with Clutch Sports the day before he died. Right. Like, literally, Rich Paul just announced it. Yeah. And so him and B.J. Boston both signed with Clutch before yeah. – the day before Terrence Clark died. So um, all that LeBron talk and Shabazz Napier, I was like, man, we got to we gotta say something about Terrence, man, because that's, that's a rough one, man. Like, I, I, that was very – like – in a time of like very sad news, that one hit harder than like ninety percent of what I saw. Yeah, nah, like, bro. You know, like, yeah, I hate that. I hate that, especially like man, car accidents. And I, when it happened, I was talking to my girlfriend about it. Like, I was like, yo, like the worst thing about car accidents is like it could be their fault. You're, like, it's just so random, and it could just literally just take your life on a mundane trip from a like I said, like he's coming back from a workout, preparing to get get in the NBA draft, and like. It's a car accident, bro. Like, yeah. I just, I don't know. I hate that. And he was so young, and he saw that potential. You talk about, yeah, it's pretty trash, bro. Yeah, he was right there too, man. About to hit the league. 
just okay. signed with an agent. Like, yeah, think think about how much jubilation he had around that moment. Like, he just signed with it. It's all good. Not just real a food. agent, the agent, Rich Paul, the agent. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Sports, LeBron, <laughs> clutch sports, bro. Like, yeah, coming man. out of Kentucky, man. Oof. That's rough. that's 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 tough, bro. Rough, rough, rough. Yeah. But yeah, man. Well, the car show always has like a musical element to it. I mean, I don't want to like rapidly switch from Terrence Clark, but I, I wanted to touch on him. But like, you know, yeah. One of the ways we always like sort of wrap the show up, so we can end on like a semi-positive note, is I always tell people to put me on a new music, man. Give me uh, if we if we were uh, if I was to grab your iPhone, right, and put it on shuffle, what 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 would be the five artists you think would come up with the most? Uh, the most. Dom Kennedy. Yes. Which I'm sure you're on to already. So well, let me tell you, I never heard Dom Kennedy before we went up to I think Howard one weekend. Yeah. Like, and <laughs> this you plays in Dom Kennedy. Yeah. And like I didn't want to listen to anything else for the rest of the ride. Hey, you know? like, Dom Kennedy. <laughs> Dom Kennedy's so smooth, man. Like it's just smooth Ooh, raps. Yeah. yeah, and that's how that's Larry June kind of is in that pathway as well now. Um, but Dom Kennedy. You know who I really got big on when I was driving Amazon was uh, Ari Lennox. Yeah. Uh, it's very, her, again, her music is very therapeutic, very, like, it just put me at ease in my mind. Like, Shea Butter Baby, that album was just, like, I'd be hot, dripping sweat, running back and forth in these houses, dropping packages off. But that would have me, like, in a state where I felt like I was chilling by the pool, sipping an angry orchard. Like, right. it's dope. Um, uh, Ari Lennox, Dom Kennedy. I've really been... You said what? Out of the Dreamville. Dreamville, yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. She and she had some good stuff on that uh Dreamville tape they put out. Um, who else? Uh, probably Two Chains and Twenty One Savage. I've been listening to a lot of both of them randomly. Yeah, <laughs> like Twenty One's album is like very underrated. I think that last album he put out. Which one? The one that the one that has Jay Cole in the intro? No, the one that has like what's the uh the one that has a uh, What's his name? Morgan Freeman, like, narrating the whole thing. I need to listen to that one. What's that one Maybe called? it's called Savage Mode. I forget what it's called. Um, but, nah, it's really good. So, okay. 21 Savage. Two Chains, I think, his albums get slept on. And his latest album is really good. You, If you haven't listened to, I think it might be Savage Mode 3 or something like that. If you haven't listened to 21 Savage's last album, you got to go listen to that. You got to listen to Two Chains' last album. Okay. Um. So help me God. That's two chains last album. Yep. So those are on your to-do list for sure. I'm sure you've heard Shea Butter Baby. Yep, for sure. For sure. That's a great, that's a great album. Heard that one I'm talking about early. the album, not just the song. Right. Um Yeah, it's called Savage Mode 2. Savage Mode 2. For uh, 21. That album is just great. So Help Me God by Two Chains, just great. Would not recommend Dom Kennedy's last album, which is rap and roll. Zero out of zero for 10 or whatever you want to say. <laughs> zero out of 10 stars. Would not recommend yeah. that. Would not recommend. All of his old stuff I love. That's my favorite rapper, but I would not recommend. See, mixtape Dom and album Dom are two different things. Exactly. Like, and he has classics as mixtapes already. Of like. course. Of course. But, yeah. You That's listen to uh, Slime Language, too? I haven't. Like, I haven't. I like Young Thug and Doses. Yeah. I don't know if I can listen to a whole tape of Young Thug. Well, the, the the album's like thirty songs too. Like, oh god, you can't do you can't do thirty songs of Young Thug, but he does have some. He does have some heat on there for sure. Okay, I mean, I'm not against it. My thing, I just like again, like I'm not sitting at home listening to Young Thug. I'm sorry, like, right? Maybe if I was like going out more, like I might hear some of it. I'm just like, again, you heard the people I'm listening to. The Young Thug don't vibe into that that way. Right, <laughs> like, right, right. Exactly, exactly. So. Who you got? Give me a recommendation before we dip out, man. Man, who do you Other than Young Thug. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of who I've been bumming lately, man. Um, put me on the spot, man. That's my question. Nobody ever Bro. asked me. <laughs> what? <laughs> Nobody ever asked me. Uh, what's the last? All right, so if you hopped in your car right now, what would you put on? Or if you were starting a road trip, what's the first album you would go to? If I was starting a road trip, I would start with... Start with some classic, man. That's the problem. Yeah, don't do the road trip thing because you're always going to go to a classic album on the road trip. Yeah. But if you were going to the grocery store right now, it's a 10 minute drive. I'm bumping the grocery store. I'm trying to think, man. I'm trying 
think. Honestly, man, it would be something more. It would be something more guitar oriented. Honestly, man, like I've been I've been going back and listening to like either guitarists or like songs that have samples because I'm like trying to learn them for uh, for the Kari show. So like, what's the best? What's the best rap song with a guitar rift? Uh, are you talking about like the best? The best. I mean, because like. A lot of rap songs use guitars. I mean, like, well, I mean, like, you know, when they like pause the song and let that guitar, like, like, like an um, dude, Kanye, Kanye has a ton of sick guitars. Yes, man. Kanye's like, got, he's got, he's got Devil in a New Dress. Oh my um, god, like, you know, he's got that's he's number got, one to me. Yeah, that's number one. But you that go, one, you go. That one's pretty good. Um, he's got Devil in a New Dress. I mean, obviously, he's got All Falls Down, um, which is another big time guitar song. Um, I mean, he's just got, I mean, I, I did a hell of a life tutorial because um, that one's actually easy enough to learn. Um, yeah. Yeah. But like what, what I've what I've been enjoying recently, honestly, is just putting together just riffs, man. Like like when DMX died, <coughs> I learned X gonna give it to you. Um, I did a tutorial of that one. That was pretty I cool. I saw that. Um, I think my next riff tutorial when I get back and actually have guitar in my hands is going to be uh, uh, Bad Boys for Life. You know, the one where it's like, we ain't going nowhere. We ain't going nowhere. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. okay, okay. I learned that one on guitar, man. Like, that one's dope. Um, okay. So that's really what I've been listening to. I've been, I've been kind of, like, putting my guitar, my playlist on shuffle and looking for things to, uh, to, to, to kind of riff on. Okay. Learn and teach to people. Okay. So that's my right. answer. A roundabout. I rock with it. I rock with it though. But I mean, if you want to, I mean, if you want to, if you want like an old school guitarist who's just like the man, Carlos Santana. Like, okay. He's he's a super old school. Like he was late sixties, man. Yeah. But um, like if you just want to hear someone who's just incredible at the guitar, you know, and he has some he has some mainstream crossover hits. Like he was on um, he was on the Miseducation of Lauren Hill. Um, you know that song to Zion? Mm -hmm. Um, now the joy in yeah. my world, uh -huh. right? Yeah, he did the guitar That's... on that. He did the guitar to that. Um, you know, okay. uh, DJ Khaled did uh, Maria Maria, he did a remix yeah. to Maria Maria, Maria Maria. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that the guitar on that is sick, but I, yeah. honestly, that's not his best stuff. The best stuff is his like solo stuff. Okay, so, um, I've been, I've been listening to some Santana man trying to get back into it. Okay, I'll check. So I'll check one or two things. I know for sure that that to Zion is pure heat. Everything on that tape is is, is nice, but obviously that's a good song. Oh yeah, for so. sure, for sure. Lauren Hill dropped one album and was like, "I'm good." <laughs> out. Man, that's that Gemini stuff. Because I see my boy Kendrick Lamar don't want to give us any more albums either. So, man, I, I thought Cole and, and Kendrick were supposed to give us a dual album, man. Whatever happened, man, they are liars. <laughs> they are liars. <laughs> That's like when my dad said he was gonna pick me up on time for football practice. Like, I don't believe that. <laughs> believe nothing you're saying. <laughs> man, man. Wow. Cool, man. It was good catching up, man. For sure, bro. You, uh, for sure, man. Me and Michelle chopping it up. It's my treat, my honor, man. And enjoy the rest of your vacation. Thanks for having me in here. Appreciate you, bro. We'll talk soon. For sure. All right. Take Peace. it easy.